Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here, and welcome back for the first time in quite a while to 10 Tiny Details in Skyrim. The last entry to the series we uploaded on July 8th, so exactly one month prior to when this video should go live. And that was a sort of special edition, one that didn't really introduce any new easter eggs or references regarding The Elder Scrolls V, but instead just highlighted some of my favorites we've covered over the past couple of years. After that video, I got a bit caught up with some other ideas, however, we are finally giving this series some love yet again. You know the drill. Cozy up by the fire, grab a bottle of your favorite mead, hunting brew, or blackbriar, I promise not to judge, and relax as we jump right in to yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, Part 52. Starting off, during the quest Lost to the Ages, we'll be sent by the ghost of a now dead researcher named Katria it's a long story, to recover a number of special artifacts, known as Ethereum Shards, that are spread across a handful of Dwarven Ruins. Now, most of the shards are found in ruins that we could have entered long before initiating this quest, including a location known as Mizulft. Well, if you've already cleared out this dungeon specifically and looted it, when you and Katria return to find the shard inside, located within the storeroom, she'll have some unique dialogue, commenting on the fact that someone's clearly already been here. She just doesn't know it was you. There you are. Looks like this place has been cleaned out. At least the shard is still here. Next on our list, speaking of unique dialogue, when approaching an Argonian male character, if the Dragonborn has a high sneak skill, and or is actively sneaking, they may say this, alluding to the ancient shadow scale order of Argonian assassins hailing from Black Marsh. You remind me of the shadow scales from the old histories. Ah, I am now like the shadow scales of old. Coming in at number three. Bleak Falls Barrow will, for many players, be the first dungeon we visit after Helgen. The main questline sends us there pretty early on, and it serves as an impressive introduction to puzzles, Draugr, Claws, and other staples of Skyrim dungeon crawling. But did you know that buried within Skyrim's game data, Bethesda actually created two versions of Bleak Falls Barrow? There's of course the one we visit in the release version of the game itself, but then there's a second, slightly altered Bleak Falls Barrow, only accessible through the use of console commands. This other variant of the same dungeon is referred to as the E3 Demo Bleak Falls Barrow cell in the game's files. And as such a name implies, it was created by Bethesda specifically for use at Skyrim's 2011 E3 demo showcase. And there are a few key differences you'll notice if you decide to explore this place with console commands. For one, the lighting is quite a bit different, arguably of a lower quality, and it makes use of fewer particle effects, with a redder, less exposed lighting temperature. Additionally, certain rooms have been replaced in the E3 setting. That place where you have to turn a few podiums in order to align their pictures in an effort to open up a gate has been replaced with a small dining room, overran by skeevers for instance. When you exit the E3 dungeon, you'll end up staring down the city of Whiterun in the distance, whereas the actual Bleak Falls Barrow we experience has an exit that faces Riverwood and the south. Most notably, the E3 dungeon is also all one cell, with absolutely no loading screens inside. Though the vanilla BFB we got is of course divided in half by a loading screen we face midway through. I find it pretty fascinating how the developers went out of their way to make these adjustments for E3, and it's neat to know that the level we experience in the game itself is quite a bit different than the one that we all saw on stage. For fourth spot, this one's also kind of long. While we're on the topic of barrows, on the island of Solstheim, we can come across an old Nord ruin known as White Ridge Barrow, 
We've discussed this location a bit before over on the channel, so I'll be brief in describing it. Essentially, when the Dragonborn first arrives at this dungeon, you'll find it overrun with hostile, unique spiders including fire spiders, mind control spiders, poison spiders, shock spiders, and more. You get the idea, lots of special creepy crawlies here that you can't find anywhere else. As you progress through the location and cut your way through these arachnids, a couple of journals found on bodies will reveal what unfolded here prior to your arrival. Evidently, a while back, Two Dunmer siblings and researchers, Merlilar and Servos Rendas, discovered this old ruin for themselves, and found just a few of these unique spiders living here. Already being scientifically proficient, they decided to set up shop within White Ridge's depths, and began studying the creatures. After a while, they were able to construct a mechanism that allowed them to clone, create, and domesticate the spiders. Eventually, Merlilar, the sister, went a tad bit crazy, possibly due to the influence of a mind control spider, and killed her brother, and the whole operation sort of fell apart. We'll be able to use that special device the siblings created, called an imbuing chamber, found within their makeshift lab, in order to make some of these spiders for ourselves, and use them to do our bidding, which is fun. However, what one may find so intriguing about this whole affair, I mean, other than everything we've just discussed, is the question of how exactly did the original spiders get here anyway? The journals we find clearly state the siblings only found some already here when they arrived. They simply cloned them to make the problem even worse. So, how were some already here? Well, believe it or not, the Elder Scrolls Online's Morrowind expansion seems to offer us an answer to that very question. The quest, Web of Troubles, offered to the player by a Breton noblewoman named Clarisse Laurent, living south of Vivec City, sends the player to investigate the strange disappearances of a couple of her associates. During the mission, we soon locate one of them, only to find the man acting mad, rambling on about spiders. Long story short, it turns out a Daedric priest created some special spiders to spread terror across the region, and we'll have to defeat him. At the end of the quest, when we report back to Clarisse Laurent for the final time, she will have a few of the captured spiders, and will inform the player of her intention to send them off to some friends she has at a place called White Ridge Barrow for further examination. Never more durable than he appears. I know a scribe who lives near White Ridge Barrow in Skyrim. His fascination with spiders borders on obsession, but I'm sure he'll appreciate the scrolls. That right there is how the arachnids got on Solstheim. The answer's not on the island itself, nor Skyrim's mainland, but instead it can be found in the province of Morrowind, roughly 1,000 years prior to the events of The Elder Scrolls V. Halfway through at number 5, Oh, this was pretty cool. So, following Alduin's attack on Helgen, after you make your daring escape from the city with either Hadvar or Rayloff, you'll be sent to Riverwood, the nearest settlement, to make sure it's okay, and speak with either Alvor, the town's blacksmith and Hadvar's uncle, or Gerder, Rayloff's sister and the de facto mayor of the village, depending on who you flood Helgen with to ask for help. Well, hinging on whether or not you arrive in Riverwood before either Rayloff or Hadvar, and speak with Gerder or Alvor respectively before they get there, the dialogue we experience will change ever so slightly. Take a listen. Hadvar, what are you doing here? Are you on leave from shores, boats? What happened to you, boy? Shh, are you in uncle, some kind please, of trouble? Keep your voice down. I'm fine. But we should go inside to talk. What's going on? And who's this? He's a friend. Saved my life, in fact. Come on, I'll explain everything, but we need to go inside. I... It flew right over the barrel! Ain't every day we get visitors in Riverwood. If you keep on like this, Adler, you know how do you know him? And I've got better things to do than this in the world. Did he not? That doesn't sound like my nephew at all. I doubt he'd be mixed up with the likes of you. What? A dragon? In Helgen? 
That explains what I saw earlier. Flying down the valley from the south. I was hoping I was wrong about what I thought it was. You're right. I saw it. Didn't want to believe my own eyes is all. Uncle Halvor, hello. Hadvar? Oh, thank Talos. Your friend told me about Helgen. Come on inside. Sigrid will get you something to eat, and you can tell us what happened. Sixth, Skyrim's a land with a surprising abundance of music. It seems in any tavern or overnight inn you find, no matter how remote, there will always be a bard inside willing to fill the walls with a song or two. And let's not forget about the Bard's College in Solitude, an entire academic institution dedicated to the training and improvement of the region's musicians. Something really interesting, though, is that when playing the lute, that guitar-like instrument, if you pay attention to a bard's fingers, they'll actually move around to form real chord patterns. Seriously, their finger movement is realistic. It's been over eight years since this game came out, and I literally just noticed this, like, today when putting together this video, after I saw it pointed out by some comments. Sadly, regardless of which chords the bards are trying to play, there doesn't appear to be any real difference in the sound the loot produces. But still, an impressive detail that I'm very glad to see exist. Next. Argonian Bloodwine is a beverage introduced by Skyrim's Hearthfire DLC. It grants the consumer a 40% resistance to poisons and the ability to breathe underwater for 50 seconds. We've talked a little bit about it before, in particular regarding how it, in fact, has appeared in a few previous Elder Scrolls games. Though what I previously neglected to mention, mainly because I was just unaware, though got a scolding from the comment section, is that Bloodwine's existence in the Elder Scrolls universe seems to be a reference by Bethesda to Klingon Bloodwine from the Star Trek series. Unbeknownst to me when I was making that first video, Bloodwine was coined by Star Trek's writers as a beverage typically enjoyed by Klingons. Skyrim's spin on the drink appears to be preferred by a more lizard-like clientele, but still, the more you know! Coming in at number 8, Based in the depths of Riften's underground sewage system, Skyrim's Thieves' Guild is renowned for their ability to operate in stealth and secrecy. Though, if you've ever used the secret entrance to get into their headquarters, chances are you've realized that they at times can be anything but quiet. Their hidden entrance to the city's sewage system lies within a small tomb in Riften's graveyard, where a button can be pressed, causing a hidden room to be exposed, allowing you to descend into the guild's base, without navigating throughout a whole labyrinth of tunnels. Though, if you use this often, you've probably noticed just how loud the whole mechanism is. I mean, we're in the middle of a heavily populated city, a hold capital in a frequented graveyard, and every time you want to secretly enter your hideout, Everyone and their brother will be alerted to the sound of scraping stones and rumbling dirt. Pretty poor planning, if you ask me. Alas, funnily enough, it seems we're not alone in noticing how ridiculously loud and attention-drawing this whole system is. As within the local Temple of Mara, located right in front of the graveyard, a note titled Reports of a Disturbance, directed towards the head priest Marmaral, can be found sitting on a table, and it reads as follows. Quote, Maramal, We've gotten numerous reports of disturbances in the graveyard next to the temple, and we'd like you to investigate. The reports describe strange noises, noted as, quote, stone grating on stone, and shadowy figures moving about the mausoleum. I've sent a guard to investigate, but they've come up empty-handed. We've already spoken to Alessandra, but she assures me these odd reports have nothing to do with any rituals of RK she might be performing. Any help you could render would certainly be appreciated. Signed, Anuriel, Steward of Riften. It appears that our concerns are well-founded. Other people have very much been bothered by the sound of our secret entrance, 
Though I've yet to put two and two together, and discover what exactly these sounds are coming from, and they haven't figured out the full scope of what's going on. Thankfully. Nevertheless, be careful the next time you're trying to sneak inside of the cistern. Don't want to draw any more attention than that we already have. Getting close to the end here at number 9, Illinolta's Deep is a flooded fortress inhabited mostly by necromancers on the banks of Lake Illinolta. Inside, we'll find a plethora of flooded out rooms and hulls, and the entire setting is pretty much impossible to navigate without getting water all inside your shoes. What a bummer. The flooding's worse in some parts than others. There's a small section of the fortress that's in fact completely underwater. And if you decide to go for a swim there, you may discover a submerged room. Where, floating at the top of it, is a copy of the alteration skill book, Breathing Water. Very funny, Bethesda. And finally, last on our list, the bandits held up at Fort Ragstag, north of Dragon's Bridge in the Hoffingar Hold, are pretty weird. Like, what I mean is that, for whatever reason, inside of the fort itself, you'll find the bandits have cooking ingredients just all over the place. Way more than they have any right keeping. It seems as though at some portions of the place, they've been experimenting with new types of food or meshing ingredients together. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and the game doesn't directly communicate anything to us. This is all just background environmental storytelling, but still, it's odd. Anyway, what strikes me as so amusing is that on a dresser next to the bandit chief's bed, you'll find a clove of garlic, half a loaf of bread, and a wheel of cheese. Suggesting that this man may have been on the cusp of introducing cheesy garlic bread to the continent of Tamriel. Admittedly, there's no way we can 100% confirm this is what Bethesda was trying to communicate with all these objects, and even if it is, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But there's really no other reason for Bethesda to put a half loaf of bread, cheese, and garlic all next to each other on a seemingly out-of-place dresser, unless this is what they were going for. So, the next time you find yourself clearing out Fort Ragstag, maybe go a little bit easy on the bandit leader here. He is, after all, likely a culinary genius. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Episode 52 of 10 Tiny Details You May Have Missed in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. It's good to be back making videos for the series that sort of started it all. And I hope you enjoyed. If so, like ratings are, as always, very much appreciated. And if you really enjoyed, subscribing and tapping that bell, which does apparently work now, would also be incredibly helpful. Anyway, again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.